Lakeland Public Television presents Currents with host Ray Gildow. Sponsored by Nisswa Tax Service, offering tax preparation for individuals and businesses across from the City Hall in Nisswa and on the web at nisswatax.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Lakeland Currents where this evening uh, it's my opportunity and uh, pretty unique opportunity to uh, welcome the two newest orthopedic surgeons to the Cuyuna Regional Medical Center in Crosby. And uh, they are two of now what are seven staff surgeons, which really is incredible when you consider the size of the area, is the size of the Crosby Ironton area, so that's pretty cool. To my immediate right is Susan Moen, who is a hand specialist, orthopedic mm -hmm. surgeon, and Dr. Jonathan Herthes, Herseth, rather, Correct. and you are a general orthopedic surgeon. Do you have a specialty? I, yeah, I do um, uh, general orthopedics. I also had uh, an additional year of training in sports surgery. Um, so focusing on problems with uh, shoulder, uh, knees, um, um, yeah, as well as hips. So. Well, let's just talk a little bit about your backgrounds because you're both new to the area. Susan, I think you've been here since the 1st of September, and Jonathan, mm -hmm. I don't know how long you've been here. About the same about time. About the same time. Started so been, about a week after. Yeah, so you've so. been here a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. And your first impressions of the region? Love it. That's great. Yeah. And I know you work at satellite, maybe do you both work at satellite yeah. places? So you've got a satellite uh, office in Baxter? Yep. And another Correct. one in, what, is it Aiken? Aiken. In Aiken. Mm -hmm. So you yep. have three different sites where patients can contact you if they need your services. Uh, Susan, what's your background? Uh, I grew up in Stillwater, uh, and we used to vacation up here all the time when really? I was younger. Yeah, so that's how I became familiar so where with did the you area. Hang out? Uh, we used to go up on Gull Lake. Okay. And <laughs> I was too young to really remember which resort, so don't ask me. <laughs> I just remember it being some of my favorite trips when we were younger. I grew up as a big water skier, so. Uh, and then, you know, I went to college and medical school and I've been gone for 10 years. And so the chance to come back to Minnesota uh, was something I was looking for. And, and the practice that Dr. Severson built is just mm -hmm. incredible mm -hmm. up here. So. And you went to Creighton University in Omaha. Yes. And uh, you said that you had 130 or so students in your class. Mm -hmm. And you were sort of amazed to find out that you're a woman in a man's field. Really, yeah, aren't you? so eleven percent of practicing orthopedic surgeons are women. Wow, that, uh, that surprises me. I, I didn't realize that. Yeah, it's you know up in this area, it's nice. You know, I'm not the only female orthopedic surgeon in the area, but um, so it's nice to have that uh, in this region mm -hmm. and see that it's kind of changing and shifting some. But and you said the first thing you look at when you meet people are their hands. I do. What are you looking for when you, when you talk to us? Well, a lot of different things. I look, uh, I can't help myself. <laughs> I see a lot of people have had run-ins with uh, chain saws or table saws oh, in their past. <laughs> no fingers and that sort of thing. Yeah, but you know, you can see arthritis at times or some different hand conditions that uh, kind of present themselves. and are very subtle, apparently, if you're not looking for them, but uh, I've grown accustomed to kind of looking at people's hands and going, oh, you have this. Mm. And it's incredible what you see. And Jonathan, what's your background? So I'm a native to Minnesota as well. I grew up in Roseau, Minnesota. Um, I kind of stuck around, though. I did all my training here. University uh, in, of Minnesota? Yeah, so I, um, I did uh, medical school starting at Duluth. Uh, so I did two years up in Duluth, and then uh, as the program goes, you go to the cities for your last two years. And um, I also did uh, orthopedic residency training uh, at the University of Minnesota, and then um, a uh, sports, um, an additional year of sports training at Tree Orthopedic Center. So did you have? In, did you work with specialists at that center? Were they people that just did knees, or just did shoulders, or elbows, yep. or did you work with all? kinds of them. Yeah, so uh, um, uh, at some of those larger centers, the people kind of have their niche. And uh, so we had people that worked specifically with shoulder. And so I would have an opportunity to work with them. People that did only knee uh, type of surgery and I, I had the opportunity to work with them. So it was a great opportunity. Um, uh, I got to uh, uh, get some exposure to um, uh, high school, college, and uh, professional sports teams uh, during that year um, and got to uh, kind of see um, 
you know, what their what their uh, day to day uh, operations are in terms mm -hmm. of taking care of athletes. Mm -hmm. So, what attracted you folks to this area? Uh, it's so common to. I, I have. I, I was a coach for thirty years, and a lot of my former players went to the big cities where they could make all the money. What attracted you to rural Minnesota? Well, I think. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interject, but Go for it. <laughs> I think um, for me specifically, um, uh, you know, I wanted to try to fulfill part of the mission of our the medical school that I chose to attend. Mm -hmm. um, uh, University of Minnesota Duluth campus specifically is very focused on rural medicine. Um, uh, ideally, they would have wanted me to go into family practice, and I um, did fail them in that regard. But I did <laughs> want to fulfill the mission of uh, trying to stay in a rural area and provide medical care in a rural area. But you knew right away you wanted to go into a specialty like orthopedics. You didn't. I did not know right away. So I did not. Originally, know right you were going to be a family practitioner, and that yeah, that was my original plan, and that was my original goal, and um, you know, life circumstances uh, happen and all of a sudden your interests kind of change. Mm -hmm. um, I had uh, I had a rotation in uh, orthopedics early on in my third year of training and absolutely loved it and then later that year I had a pretty significant knee injury that had required a lot of surgery, a lot of rehab and and uh, after that occurred I was um, uh, I became very interested in orthopedics and that's what I wanted to do. Susan, tell us what's unique about an orthopedic hand surgeon. What, what, why is that different than just an orthopedic surgeon? Yeah, so you know, I did my five years of residency in Akron, Ohio to be an orthopedic surgeon to do kind of treat all the conditions. Uh, I really found a lot of interest in the hand because there's a lot of moving, moving parts and it's very intricate balance. Um, and there's a lot of really small things. The glasses that I wear in the OR have the little microscopes in them uh, to see them, and there's some microsurgery involved. And, really? Uh, kind of so, like Google glasses? Yeah. <laughs> but they work. They you know? work. Yeah, Google <laughs> sort of, they, they've disappeared, haven't they? <laughs> but uh, so, you know, I found the anatomy and uh, the complexity of it very fascinating, and there's a lot of different things that can then go wrong, but then there's a lot of different ways you can fix it. So there's not just you know arthritis, there's problems with tendonitis or ligament injuries or issues with your nerve compression or, or blood flow uh, that all kind of fall into that category. So how do people with problems with their hands know to come to you versus to go to a Jonathan? Do, do you work that out within your team or how, how do they know? Yeah, People that don't know you and they, they got a problem with their hand, would they just go to Jonathan and he would refer them to you? Or how does that work? Yeah. Um, you know, I think we have a system in play. You know, if people call in and they uh, want to be seen for something specific. Um, like they we, say, my thumb hurts, then the, the nurses are able to triage it to yeah. the provider. Unless they have a specific request, then we have them see who they would like to see and then we talk amongst ourselves and work out right. who's appropriate. To and it's, it's not it. terribly uncommon where I, I occasionally see patients that have multiple problems and you know for things that involve the upper extremity I you know aside from the shoulder you know I might um, see if uh, Susan would be willing to see that patient. Mm -hmm. um, so that you know we, we kind of work as a team you know I wouldn't say we're just uh, you know individual units running around. Uh, we you know, we, we talk, communicate, and try to mm -hmm. get uh, each patient to the appropriate provider. So you're talking about microsurgery, um, like carpal tunnel. Is that still pretty much the basic same surgery that it's been for 10 years? Or is, do you see that changing too? So there's a couple different ways that you can do it. The way that I do it is the way that Dr. Paul Severson has been doing it up here for years and really made it the standard of care for the area. Um, which is kind of advanced in some regions still, uh, and that's through a, a scope. So it's actually using a camera to visualize the ligament. Uh, it means a smaller incision in the palm. Uh, it's still the same procedure in the end as far as the final outcome, but patients seem to prefer it as far as the incision and recovery time. Hmm. Yeah. So how far can you actually see along that. You can see the whole ligament. Really? With a scope? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep. 
and then that blows up on a screen, I suppose, like a TV screen or something. Yeah. And then do you do that surgery from that screen? Mm -hmm. Wow. It has a little blade and that uh, kind of flips up and it, it cuts the ligament and you watch on the screen actually as it cuts it. So it's pretty so cool. So when, when people come to you, and, and I, I've seen people with extreme arthritis where they're yeah. just, their hands are deformed. Mm -hmm. What can you do for those people? Or is there anything you can do? Well, it depends on the cause of the arthritis. Sometimes if it's something like a rheumatoid arthritis, which is more a systemic problem, then medications are really the mainstay. Uh, if there's certain joints that are bothersome, then we can try and treat them with injections or with therapy. Uh, and then sometimes there's surgeries to try and help with those certain joints. The difficult thing is it's not like your shoulder where it's one basic joint, you have all of the joints in your hand, every knuckle is a joint. And so uh, to try and treat all of those, to try and prioritize, you know, okay, which ones are the ones that are causing pain? Uh, and how do we make those feel better and keep your function and your motion? Now, I'm not suggesting you've done this before, but um, we're seeing more and more reattached hands mm -hmm. or attached hands for the first time from one person to another. Would a person, a, a neurologist who does that sort of work, work with an orthopedic surgeon for the rehab portion of it then? Or how, does, how would that typically work in a hospital? So it, the people who <laughs> reattach hands uh, and that are generally our hand specialists, whether they come at it through plastic surgery or orthopedic surgery, they're hand surgeons who do that procedure. That generally requires a pretty big facility and they have multi-surgeon teams that do those procedures uh, and it's relatively uncommon. So uh, when it comes into that, then, then you're looking at really a multi-specialty team and then multiple hand surgeons working together to, to reattach something that, uh, that's, that's significantly injured. That's so. amazing technology, it really is. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, you talked about your knee injury. Mm -hmm. Um, as a coach for many, many years, I, I'm just amazed at how many more ACLs and meniscus issues that we're seeing. Yep. Are, are these just overuse injuries for the most part, or what do you think is causing well, this? Well, no, I, you know, I think um, uh, there's very well de defined mechanisms as to why some of these injuries happen. Um, uh, there's very specific knee positions that the knee might be placed in during competitive uh, athletics that predisposes you to uh, you know, rupturing your ACL or having other ligamentous injuries. Um, one of the big focuses um, in kind of the sports world has been to really um, maximize preventative measures in terms of um, decreasing the incidence of uh, ACL injuries. And, you know, I think overall the results of these preventive measures have been good. It's a little bit hard to delineate um, uh, in the population uh, just how effective we've been with it. But I think uh, the general consensus is that there has been some good uh, effect with that. So if you were talking to coaches who might be watching, you would say, is there a place that you can go and learn about the kinds of activities you can do to strengthen knees and arms to prevent these kinds of injuries yeah. that you know of? So um, physical therapists and uh, athletic trainers have become pretty well versed in the preventative measures um, as well as sports medicine doctors as well. Um, and uh, certainly there are programs that are starting to be developed um, that can really focus you and put you through kind of a training algorithm to focus certain muscle groups to try to prevent um, injuries like that from happening. Did you happen to catch Teddy Bridgewater, the Vikings uh, quarterback, with how he just fell? It was just amazing. Yeah, that was an interesting, uh, that was an interesting mechanism. Um, well, that was kind of unusual, wasn't it, the way this happened? Yeah, yeah, that was a very significant knee injury uh, with, uh, you know, relatively low trauma. Um, uh, I have seen it one other time uh, really? in, in my training uh, where a, a gentleman had a similar mechanism to that, but it is a very, uh, very unusual um, problem. I don't know the specifics mm -hmm. of Teddy Bridgewater's right. uh, injury, but... Uh, um, uh, I know they were very concerned about arteries, uh, veins in there. Exactly, yeah, <clears throat> so a knee dislocation can be a very, very serious injury. and. Uh, could be even limb-threatening uh, in the worst-case right. scenario. So 
Uh, fortunately for him, it seems like his nerves and arteries and everything were, were okay. Wow, so. it's amazing. Talk a little bit about the microsurgery that we're hearing about. I mean, I, I, I know a couple of guys who had a hip replacement and they have a scar about this long. I don't know, is that common or is that, I know that was practiced for a while and maybe but are we getting away from that again a little bit? You know, it's, it's a constantly evolving um, methodology for doing any kind of total uh, joint replacement is, is kind of happening. There, there was a two incision technique for a total hip arthroplasty that was um, popular about 10 years ago. Um, I, I never did any training with that and I never actually um, uh, saw any of those surgeries. Uh, one of the more uh, um, you know, talked about methods is doing an anterior approach or a direct anterior approach for a total hip arthroplasty. Um, ultimately, uh, patients um, have potentially a little bit less pain and a little bit faster recovery uh, in the first uh, uh, six weeks. Um, but um, um, you know, currently, it's thought that at about one year, there's really no difference Kinda whether or not out. they go from a posterior approach or to an anterior approach. So, um, uh, my partner, uh, uh, Dr. Severson, is doing uh, some anterior hip replacements, and he also does a posterior approach. I've been uh, more well versed in doing a, a posterior approach, so that's kind of my. Uh, my go-to technique. So as we're getting older, which unfortunately we, I haven't figured out a way to stop that. We're seeing more I and have. more of these baby boomers. <laughs> uh, actually, I'm, I'm pre-baby boomer, so <laughs> I'm not a baby boomer. But I would guess that you're seeing a lot more knee and hip I issues because of people's age. I, yep. and I, I would guess the other contributing factor for America is obesity, putting a lot more weight on those particular uh, joints. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have, and just to, the nice collaboration we have at Cuyuna is uh, the general surgeons have their bariatric program, which they've really been at the forefront of the field in that and the procedures and their interventions that they have for patients in that respect. So that's really helped us in collaborating as far as, you know, what component of your um, arthritis is from you know your weight and how much and what can we do to try and take the stress off of that uh, and improve your overall health as well uh, and you know improve your outcomes with surgery because we know uh, people who are morbidly obese uh, have a higher rate of complications with their joint replacements so we want the best outcome for the patients so that's been a nice collaboration that uh, they've been doing now for years to try and improve outcomes for patients. So maybe get them on a program where they can lose weight, mm -hmm. um, start watching those other factors before you would have to do surgery or if you do have to do surgery get them to a certain level so that it'll be more successful recovery. Mm -hmm. I do remember Dr. Severson talking about that when he was on the program one, one year. Right. That, that's mm -hmm. um, amazing. Yeah. Looking at the whole person now, not just at a bone or just at yeah, the Yeah, absolutely. Knee. Yeah. You know, uh, obesity specifically doesn't just affect your joints. You know, it predisposes you to conditions like diabetes and, and it can be a serious, you know, health problem and um, it puts more stress on your cardiovascular system. So, um, you know, your knee might hurt, but there's definitely more benefits to losing weight mm -hmm. and trying to keep your weight down. You know, you talked about diabetes, and I know that a lot of people have lost limbs from diabetes. Mm -hmm. What happens when they do? Because I had a, my mother-in-law had lost a leg and she had diabetes, and she never took a pain pill after the surgery. And the doctor said that's not uncommon because your nerves are all gone. What does the diabetes do to our nerves when it gets to that kind of a situation? We know it changes the makeup of the nerves themselves, especially, um, and it tends to involve the small nerves and the fingertips, but we think of it more on our feet. And the first, what ultimately happens is you lose what we call protective sensation. So you step on a Lego and it hurts. Uh, that's your body's protective sensation. Or you're walking in an uncomfortable pair of shoes and you feel a blister that you take your shoes off or you stop walking or, or you look at it. If you don't have that protective sensation, you continue to walk on it and you can wear the skin all the way through. And so then you get these ulcers uh, and infection becomes a problem. 
Uh, so it's that loss of that protective sensation, kind of our body's gift of pain, that tells us something's wrong. You lose that uh, with diabetes, and that and that can be kind of the source of the problem. And then you also have a decreased ability to fight the infection once you get it. So you know, it's interesting yeah. over yeah. over the years, uh, over the ten years. Uh, this is our tenth year of our program. Have had a number of experienced doctors on from a, a number of hospitals. And they all sort of lament about the tremendous changes they're dealing with from an administrative side of being a doctor. You know, where before they could deal with their patients and the nurse or somebody else took care of all the, the paperwork. And I would guess that you being new and haven't had that burden of what it what used to be like, you're probably finding that transition easier. It, or do you, you find it frustrating the way you have to do all your reports? Well, so when I was in residency in Ohio, the hospital that I was at for the first few years was still on paper charts. And we hand wrote our notes and then you had to go physically find the chart or you had to call and had somebody read it to you and those kinds of things. And um, it led to a lot of problems of you, somebody writes a big long note, but you can't read anything that it says mm -hmm. or you don't remember what was in there and so it's somewhere else or the patient goes with it. So it, it's while there's it's cumbersome to use the electronic medical records it is also nice to have access to all this information and i can look at the most recent note from a patient's family doctor uh, without try, having to dig through the chart and try and find it uh, and go through that so while some of it is cumbersome and you know we work on trying to streamline that i think there's definitely some benefits to it i know as a patient i, I really like the fact that i can go online yeah. And tie into the team of mm -hmm. medical f staff that are working with my doctor, and I don't have to go to the clinic every time I have a question. I, I think that's pretty cool. But mm -hmm. uh, it's like change for most people. The older folks sometimes have a harder time making that change than the younger folks do. Uh, when you folks deal with your patient for the first time, I get the sense from your hospital that surgery isn't the first thing you look at. No. They always start with, you know, is it something that needs to be fixed or is this some, you know, kind of explaining <clears> the condition <throat> and then giving the patient the options. And most of the time you want to exhaust all your non-operative things such as therapy, braces, splints, injections, uh, before you progress to surgery because any surgery, no matter how small, there's complications and there's risks involved. And so you want to know that we tried, you know, all these other things, and and we've looked at all your other options before uh, we've gone to this. And for the most part, the nice thing about elective orthopedic surgery is it's not a life saving, but it can be a life changing mm -hmm. surgery. So, you know, it's the patient. The patient has some decision and some choice in it uh, where they can decide, you know, when is the right time and and what what feels right for me. I don't know what your yeah. experience has been with that. I, you know, I tell patients not infrequently that there's things we can do, you know, but the question is should we do or w do we need to do that, you know, because there are conditions where, you know, we might see a little bit of pathology. Uh, there might be a partial thickness rotator cuff tear or something like that, but people can oftentimes, you know, they don't need surgery for that right away, you know. Uh, they can get better with therapy. Uh, we could try, you know, different types of non-operative things like injections to see if we can get their pain under control so that they can actually rehab their shoulder or their, uh, you know, their muscles. And they oftentimes can avoid surgery. And, you know, I, like Susan was saying, uh, surgery is a big deal, you know. Um, uh, as uh, routine as it's maybe been thought to be, you know, uh, in the public, I think it's it's still kind of a big deal. You know, um, a lot of people get total knees. As you were saying, you know, we're hitting the baby boom generation. Uh, we're anticipating that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the number of total joints that we'll be doing in the country will possibly close to double by 2030. Wow. Uh, and so, um, um, you know, these these are seemingly routine surgeries, but they are big deal surgeries. And that's kind of my take on it. You know, I think I think it's best to try to 
try to do everything we can before we go down that road. Well, mm -hmm. I have a couple minutes left, but I, I love asking this question. I did ask it of Dr. Severson, and I remember his response, and I'll tell you when, he's, when you get through, but the first time you did your surgery, really on your own, I suppose it was residency, mm -hmm. what was that like for you the first time? <laughs> uh, it was, it was, I felt very empowered. <laughs> but, really? <laughs> yeah, it also, so you don't <laughs> realize the gentle encouragement you're hearing from the, you know, someone else when you're doing it where you kind of get a mm-hmm, mm-hmm mm -hmm. as you're going. <laughs> and so when you're doing it on your own, you're making those decisions and, you know, this is the, okay, this is where it's going to go and this is, you know, we're good, this is released and like that. So. I found it very empowering. I liked it. But. <laughs> I, I thought it was great. You know, I, um, um, it, it um, you know, just kind of reinforced what you've been training for and, and learning about. Uh, and then, uh, and then it's fun to see their reaction when you pull up the x-ray the next day. And, <laughs> and it worked. And it looks good. And they're like, well, I, I think that actually Severson, looks pretty good. I, I don't remember the exact uh, area where he was doing surgery, but I think it was something new in the gastro gastronomic uh, area maybe and he said he was basically on his own and it was petrifying he was <laughs> it was a, a first experience at yeah. doing this because he's done some cutting-edge things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, I saw I thought that was pretty unique well we're out of time believe it or not but I would like to take the opportunity of thanking both of you for appearing on our program and you will both get a new car for being here <laughs> <laughs> no not really uh, but welcome to the Brainerd Crosby area and the Cuyuna Regional Medical Center. And uh, I have you, hope you have a long and great career in the, in the communities. Thank All right. Thank well, you. thanks for having thank us. Thank you. You've been watching Lakeland Currents. Well, we're talking about what you're talking about. I'm Ray Gildow. So long until next time.